From the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis, this is Indiana Issues. Here's your host, Abdul Hakeem Shabazz. Hello and welcome to Indiana Issues. We took a little bit of a hiatus, a little bit of a break, but now we are back with a new year and all sorts of new topics. The governor does his state of state address. And the lawmakers get through their first couple weeks of legislature. Trey Hollingsworth says he's not going to run all for re-election. And we'll ask our political pundits what they see in their crystal balls. Our guests on the program today are Republican Mike Murphy, former state geo, former county GOP chairman here in Marion County, and Lindsey Ships, uh, activist uh, and Democrat progressive. Uh, we'll be joined a little bit by Brad Kloppenstein of the Greater Lawrence Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so, my friends, let's go ahead and get started uh, with our conversation here. Governor Eric Holcomb addressed a joint session of the Indiana General Assembly uh, this past week, delivered his 2002 state of, 2022 State of the State Address. Uh, the governor gives you sort of a progress report uh, for the state of Indiana. Uh, let me ask, start with you, uh, Mike. How do you think the state is doing so far? I think the state's doing great. I think the governor is, should be commended for the way he's handling the uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic. I mean, he's following the science and not the politicians, which is exactly the way he should be doing. We have a projected $5.1 billion surplus, maybe certainly among the top three or four in the country. I don't know if it's the top uh, level surplus or not. Um, and, and we are doing, we're making great progress on investments in broadband, investments in job training through next level jobs. Um, I think it's, uh, it ended up as a good year despite the pandemic, and I think the prospects are for two more great years. Lindsay, how do you think the state of Indiana is doing these days? I think that's a question for Hoosiers who are struggling every day to make their bills happen and to not get evicted. I mean, you've still got a very serious issue with folks being able to afford their daily lives and uh, struggle to find a job that pays minimum uh, a, a livable wage, given that our minimum wage is still sitting at $7.25, which is just uh, abominable to me. So I think Hoosiers are still really struggling. You know, you have your uh, number one and number two reasons for folks calling 211 as eviction and also utility bills. So we're really struggling still to keep Hoosiers afloat. Uh, in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, Mike, what about that? Uh, this sort of almost sort of this sort of two Indiana, so to speak, one Indiana uh, where unemployment is 3%, $5 billion surplus, you know, plenty of jobs available. But then though, there's still those Hoosiers that are still, like Lindsay said, are kind of left behind and are necessarily shared in the prosperity. Well, there is definitely a skills gap. I think the governor recognizes that. That's why he launched the Next Level Jobs Program. Not only will the uh, state give you $5,000 to go back to school and get a certificate and everything from welding to computer coding to get your associate's degree at Ivy Tech or Vincennes to uh, actually going back and finishing your bachelor's degree if you started it and then didn't quite uh, finish it at some point in your life. And so I think you know, we have 150,000 jobs open right now in the state. Um, you know, I know Lindsay mentions the, the minimum wage, but the fact is they can't get people to take $22 an hour jobs right now. And we have thousands of those available. Some of these companies like Amazon and others are giving out $3,000 cash bonuses just to show up your first day. So um, I think there is a, there's a long-term pro, uh, problem with skills, which I think the governor is addressing. The short-term problem, I would say get on the bus, ride a bike, get in a car, and go to any one of these uh, companies that are advertising jobs for $22 an hour. And you'll be making what does that come out to? Forty-five to fifty thousand dollars. I mean, that's a pretty good wage in Indiana. Um, as far as eviction goes, um, again, the governor has a major program for emergency rental assistance, which is frankly mostly funded by the the Biden administration. And um, they're having problems getting people to bite to even apply for it. And so um, I think that if all you have to do is go to the site that the mayor of Indianapolis has set up or to the state site for emergency rental insurance or assistance, and they will pay your rental, they'll pay your utilities, and they'll pay your internet bill for at least 12 months. That's 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 not a bad deal. There's there's more money out there to help people than we can even imagine. The key is to encourage them to go online and apply for these programs. Uh, Lindsay, what's your reaction to what Mike said? Because uh, Mike is right. The state does have a lot of programs, uh, a lot of the, you know, for, for skill sets, for, for evictions. I do a little bit of uh, some of that myself for the Indiana Supreme Court, uh, sort of mediating differences between landlords and, and tenants. 
Well, I think you've got a great program with IHCDA uh, spearheading their recent dashboard and getting that information to Hoosiers as, as uh, direct from the source. You know, this is a fantastic program that uh, needs to be applauded. And uh, frankly, yes, Mike's right, more people need to take advantage. Um, but we still have an affordability issue despite the evictions issue itself. We have contributing factors that um, are, are, are standing to stand in the way of Hoosier's ability to, to stay in, in their homes. And that's additional issues, like I said, utility bill affordability. Utility bills have gone through the roof in the past few years. Indiana used to be really competitive in utility bill affordability, no longer. And uh, that has been an issue of topic at the State House with their tax, uh, with the House Republicans mm -hmm. unrolling their House Bill 1002 this year, or this past week, excuse me, um, with the, uh, the utility receipts tax aimed at, at reducing that for uh, Hoosiers, but unfortunately, that bill aims to benefit only large users, uh, only large users of power, and only big business, frankly. And so that'll only stand to benefit a few pennies for Hoosiers like me paying a residential bill every month. And uh, we need to do better. We need to do better to be able to to allow folks to stay in their homes and and continue to maneuver this uh, the the ill effects of this pandemic. You're watching Indiana Issues. I'm your host, Abdul Kim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndyPolitics.org. We cleared up our technical issues. Now we're joined by our good friend, Brad Kloppenstein, who's the head of the Greater Lawrence Chamber of Commerce. Brad, appreciate you joining us. Uh, we're having a discussion today about uh, sort of the governor's state of the state address. Uh, the governor talked about you know, the state surplus, uh, the next level jobs program. Uh, how do you think the state of Indiana is doing, particularly from a business perspective? By and large, I think the state's doing fairly well. I mean, it's, it's really easy to be the governor and give a state of the state address when... Right now, you've got a huge surplus, and the biggest issues on the table are social issues, and those aren't very big. So, um, I mean, I, I thought he did a good job. I'd like to see a little bit more vision. He's not throwing a lot of things out there that are real earth-shattering and are necessarily going to take Indiana to uh, 10 years, 15, 20 years into the future. But um, he's in a good position, and it wasn't a bad speech. Uh, Brad, let me just, while I got you here, let me ask you this too, because I know uh, the big question is what to do with the, with the, with the, with the bountiful surplus uh, that's happened, uh, in part because of the, the Biden Build Back Better programs and the American Recovery Act, but also because you had so much sort of vent up, uh, sort of cash frustration amongst Hoosiers. Uh, what should we do with, with our revenue? Should we cut taxes? Should we lower the business personal property tax? Uh, should we pay off debt? Uh, what do businesses, what would businesses like to see done? I think a combination, um, certainly cut a cut in business uh, property taxes would be fantastic and we would be welcomed. But I also think we want to make sure that uh, we're investing in our infrastructure, roads, broadband, things that are really going to put at us in a key position to take advantage of where we are geographically and take advantage of the people that we have here in Indiana. So, so I think a combination of cuts and, and investment is really what the business community is looking for. Uh, let's, let me get you through to jump in here. Uh, should the state be cutting taxes or uh, investing in uh, sort of uh, quality of life type programs? Well, you can certainly tell it's an election year at the Indiana State House because you see a lot of bills being filed that benefit big uh, corporations and and donors to uh, to campaigns. And what you don't see uh, are benefits coming to Hoosiers every day who are struggling to meet the needs of their families and where uh, even a quote unquote, good paying job, like Mike said earlier, of $50,000 a year really doesn't cut it for a family of four, much less a family of six, uh, when you're trying to make it uh, make it through day to day. So um, I certainly can tell that the, the House Republicans and Senate Republicans are fundraising uh, by each one of these bills that get filed. Uh, Mike, uh, cut taxes, invest invest uh, in programs. What should the state do with its with surplus? Well, it's, it's easy for me to say both, <laughs> but I, I, I will... I will put an umbrella over that and, and say that I think the governor is doing exactly what he should be doing, which is being very cautious. It's easy to uh, you know spend all the money. He could do it in two weeks if he wanted to, but uh, we it's not a budget year. We have to remember that. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen with all kinds of things, whether it's the stock market, whether it's uh, you know uh, more pandemic expenses, whatever. So I think he's being wise. I think next year you will see, um, he's already promised it, and I'm so glad to see this, you'll see major investments in mental health programs, which will include opioid, opioid addiction programs, and also in public health investment. Last time I looked, 
Uh, the state of Iowa, which is demographically very similar to ours, except for about half the population, um, they spend twice as much money per capita on public health as Indiana does. And I think, you know, you have to invest in public health to, to solve or mitigate the uh, infant mortality problems, maternal health uh, mortality, and other major problems, including, as I mentioned, mental health and uh, opioid addiction problems. I think um, 40% of uh, the, 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 uh, the addiction deaths have gone up 40% this year. Scott Davison from uh, One America said that the death rate between people, Americans 18 to 64, has jumped 40%, which is historic in its proportions. And we, uh, we need to uh, get on that as quickly as we can, as quickly as we know we have the money to do it. And I think that's in the next budget year. Our guest on the program today all here on Indiana Issues is Republican Mike Murphy, Democrat Lindsey Ships, and a good friend Brad Kloppenstein from the Greater Lawrence Chamber of Commerce. My friends, as we record this program, lawmakers have just wrapped up week two of the Indiana General Assembly, getting ready to, to start week three. Uh, the, it's interesting because even though we're, we're flush with cash and, and tax cuts are part of the discussion, there are also some social issues out there, such as critical race theory and also uh, sort of the vaccine mandates. Uh, Lindsey, let me start with you. Uh, is this a waste of time or are lawmakers just basically doing what their constituents want them to do and handle these issues? I don't see any positive move forward to benefit teachers in this session whatsoever. So if you're asking me if it's if that was a serious question that we're doing good things for teachers, absolutely not. I don't I don't see one piece of legislation at this point, except maybe one that uh, Representative Ed Clear is carrying that would actually protect teachers um, that benefits anybody in the classroom, whether that's a student, a child, uh, an administrator, or a taxpayer. Uh, so we've got a lot to do if we are going to call this session a, a good session for teachers. Uh, Mike, uh, critical race theory, uh, vaccine exemption of employer vaccine mandates. Uh, your thoughts on are, are lawmakers basically doing what their constituents want, or are we just, like I said, because we don't have to worry about money anymore, at least for a while, we, we, we delve into the social issues? Sure. And, it's, and Lindsay's right. It is an election year. And, and, and you know, once the, uh, as you mentioned before last week, I think, Abdul, once the, the, the uh, candidate filing period ends on February 5th or whenever that is, then you'll see a lot more flexibility in people's minds because they'll know whether they have a primary opponent or not. But, you know, critical race theory, the term has been around since 1938. This is very obviously politicized by both Republicans and Democrats. I think Bain, uh, Representative Bain, the chair of the Education Committee, is doing a good job by uh, in, indirectly addressing it through broader curriculum uh, uh, regulation, so to speak. And I think he's, he's doing a great job, actually. Um, when it comes to teachers, I mean, you, you can't get everything all the time. I mean, the governor just made sure the te teachers got significant raises last year, and I hope they're they're still enjoying those. Um, on the, you know, just a full disclosure, I I represent two different um, uh, school districts uh, in Indiana, and I help you know their superintendents think and their school boards think through issues and problems, and. Um, I don't think anybody's complaining right now about wages and things. I think what they are worried about is the the kind of roller coaster ride they're putting teachers through on, you know, you know, teach teach at home, teach in person, mask, no mask, vaccinations, no vaccinations, and that's that's an unfortunate roller coaster all educators are on right now. Brad, let me get your thoughts on uh, how lawmakers are doing right now. Um. We'll see. It's <laughs> critical race theory, I, I kind of believe, is a false flag. Um, it's interesting to see that there's a couple bills out there that that want to give make parents have access, six months access sometimes in, in the future on, on what sort of curriculum is being presented to their students. And they want to, you know, they want to have that published and out there that completely eliminates the ability for a teacher to talk about current events because you don't know what's going to happen six months down the road. Um, it's interesting, one of the authors of one of those bills each year drops off a bunch of publications about Indiana government that they on their own dime print and drop it off at schools. But those things, he doesn't get approval to drop those off. Suddenly he's not going to be able to do that. Um, I think there's a lot of kind of micromanaging of teachers. And it's ironic because it seems like fewer and fewer parents are taking the initiative to be involved in their students' education. So I mean, all that information is available right now. All parents have to do is ask. 
Our guests on the program today are Brad Kloppenstein of the Greater Lawrence Chamber of Commerce, Mike Murphy, uh, former Republican state, former Republican county chairman here in Marin County, and our good friend, Democrat Lindsey Shipps. We're going to take ourselves a quick break. When we come back, COVID-19 and Trey Hollingsworth no longer running for re-election. You're watching Indiana Issues. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Indiana Issues. I'm your host, Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndiPolitics.org. We're taking a look at things happening here in the state of Indiana with our guests, Republican Mike Murphy, Democrat Lindsey Ships, and Brad Kloppenstein of the Greater Lawrence Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my friends, COVID-19 continues to impact the state of Indiana. The governor in the state of the state address uh, mentioned that more than at least 19,000 Hoosiers have died from COVID-19, which is the population of Jasper or Crawfordsville. And we last checked, there were slightly less, more than 50%, slightly less than 50% of Hoosiers were vaccinated and only about 11% of the ICU beds uh, were available. Uh, so, Mike, we'll start with you. Uh, is Indiana winning the fight against COVID-19? Well, I, I guess there's, there's there's two answers to that. Um, I think we are winning the fight against COVID-19 because of the heroic work of the healthcare workers, physicians, nurses, uh, even the National Guard. I am very disappointed that uh, we have such a poor, one of the worst, I think the, one of the 10 worst um, vaccination rates in the nation. And I think some of that goes to the Hoosier uh, reluctance to be told what to do. Um, we're usually the last people to adopt anything. And if you tell us that you know we should do something because New York or New Jersey is doing it, that makes legislators say, well, I'm not doing that just because New York is doing it or, or uh, LA or whatever. Um, and also minorities have a significant and legitimate concern because of the Tuskegee experiments that went on for 40 years or so. Um, and it's, it's kind of all combined to create a, a actually a very dismal record of uh, vaccinations here and it's, it's hurting everybody. But thank God for the heroic uh, healthcare workers. Lindsay, uh, how was Indiana fighting? How well is Indiana doing with its fight against COVID? I think the uh, healthcare workers that that Mike mentions and thanks just you know rightfully um, have a lot to say about this. And uh, many of our healthcare workers have said that we're not doing enough, and that a lot of Indiana is just doing business as if nothing was happening and our neighbors weren't dying around us. So I think need, we need to do more. We need more public health investment. We're giving folks a really, really big tax increase under House Bill 1002 with big businesses receiving the bulk of that. But here we are with public health funding in the toilet. And there are Republicans and Democrats and frankly, all floors of the state house invested in changing that. And yet the conversation is about a tax cut. So the conversation needs to change at the state house to benefit Hoosiers and, and keep our friends and neighbors from dying from this awful uh, virus and to continue moving forward. And, uh, and frankly, no, I don't think we're doing enough, but I don't think any state is doing enough right now. We're all unfortunately seeing the, the uh, negative impacts of this on our workforce, on our family lives, on society, and we all need to be doing more, including acting like there's an actual pandemic going on. Uh, Brad, uh, as we deal with this pandemic, uh, law Indian lawmakers right now have some legislation out there that would uh, give, so would exempt uh, certain employees uh, from uh, employer mandates, whether it's a medical exemption or religious exemption, now sort of a natural immunity uh, exemption. What are you hearing from your friends uh, in the business community? Because I know a lot of them weren't crazy about what the Biden administration was trying to do, but what do they think about what the state's trying to do uh, with employees, employers, and vaccine mandates? 
Uh, what we're hearing from our members and businesses just around the state of Indiana that uh, that they certainly don't want to mandate. And I think a lot of people look at this almost like the old seatbelt mandates. They don't believe that there should be a seatbelt ma mandate necessarily. However, people should realize that getting a vaccine and wearing your seatbelt are both good for you personally, and they should just do it. I, I don't understand this reluctance. You know, I, I understand that people don't want to be told that what they have to do. Um, but on the other hand, you should just be doing it because it's good for you and it's good for the people that you love around you. So um, I hope they get it right. But yeah, I know that em employers are certainly not looking for more mandates. They have plenty of those already. Uh, Mike, let me ask you, why don't, why don't you think more Hoosiers will get uh, vaccinated? Because like I said, our, our rate's only about 50, you know, 51, 52 percent, which is one of the lowest in the country. Well, again, it goes back to what I said just a few minutes ago. People, Hoosiers don't like to be told what to do. Remember, Abdul, I think this is still true, um, that we are the only state in the country that doesn't have a motorcycle helmet law. So in Indiana, if you want to ride around without a helmet and get your head squashed like a pumpkin, you know, when you fly off, then that's considered personal responsibility. And, you know, that's never, never passed. And for most laws, whether it's uh, seat belts or whatever that, that uh, Brad was talking about, the only way that becomes law is because the federal government uh, says we're going to take away your highway money if the state of Indiana does not pass a law. So, you know, it's it's uh, blackmail, essentially, you know, and government blackmail, if you want to call it that. So it's, it's just built into our nature. Uh, we're a very conservative state and our personality as a state is not going to change. Uh, Lindsay, uh, before we change topics real quick, I want to get your thoughts on schools. I know you have uh, small children. Uh, what's going on with, uh, should schools be open? Should they not be open? Because we hear that schools are actually a relatively safer place uh, to have kids not get exposed to COVID. Yeah, my kids' school shut down yesterday, and I had uh, very little notice on uh, adjusting my entire workday uh, today and uh, next week. So, I 100% I um, feel that pain, uh, but you know we also have to do what's smart for our kids and our teachers. And the fact is teachers were dropping like flies with, uh, with Omicron or excuse me, with COVID, um, positive COVID tests and, and they, they deserve that time off and they deserve, uh, which is one more reason we should have paid leave and paid leave that's meaningful and uh, for everyone. <laughs> and we should also be able to um, support those folks when they are out of the classroom so we can have a safe environment when our kids come back to, to school. Um, it is There is no great catch-all answer to this. Uh, we need to do more to support our, our friends and family who are teachers, but we also need to put our, our kids thrive better in school. That is what all the data shows. You know, kids are thriving and learn better when they're in the classroom setting. And that's what we're all striving to get back to as long as we can do it safely. And employers need to be more, uh, more helpful in, in terms of understanding how, um, how their employees can better maneuver these situations. And uh, I'm thankful that I have my own business um, where I can call the shots and, and move my, my clients virtually. But the fact is not everybody has that leniency from their employer. And that's what we need to work on. Our guests on the program today are Democrat Lindsey Ships, Republican Mike Murphy, Brad Klopstein from the Greater Lawrence Chamber of Commerce. You're watching Indiana Issues. I'm your host, Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndyPolitics.org. Uh, guys, we've got a few minutes left here, so I want to make sure we uh, talk about uh, Trey Hollingsworth, the 9th District Congressman, who announced recently that he's not going to run for a re-election. Uh, some of the names being mentioned, Aaron Houch, the state senator from that neck of the woods, he says she's going to run. Uh, we're hearing also hearing uh, Josh Hawley, the, uh, uh, the chief of staff for Mike Braun, uh, may run as well. Uh, Mike, uh, is this going to be another sort of free-for-all in the last place you want to be is between a, an Indiana politician with ambition and an open seat? Yeah, or a, new, or a television camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, uh, you know, Erin Houch, I think she has a good shot. She got 25% of the vote in the 2016 primary. She, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, Trey got uh, 33% or something like that. So I think, you know, she has a good conservative record. I know she works hard for her constituents. Um, you know, I don't know the other gentleman, but I think uh, that'll take care of itself. I, I'm more interested in what Trey Hollingsworth does next. And I think he will be one of five people running for governor. We have uh, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch. We have uh, Eric Doden from Fort Wayne. 
we have uh, probably Braun and himself and probably uh, Rokita. Um, you know, we'll have five, you know, four guys and a, and a woman. And um, unfortunately, uh, the women usually get pushed out of the way. You know, it happened with Sue Ann Gilroy, Sue Elsperman, Becky Skillman. And, and I've encouraged uh, Suzanne Crouch not to let herself get patted on the head and pushed out of the way. Uh, Lindsay, uh, this would be obviously uh, with Trey Hollingsworth uh, not running for election, open seat. Uh, uh, do Democrats have a shot, or at least a, a, at least a mild shot, at winning the ninth district, or has it just been so gerrymandered that it that it can't happen? Ninth district is my home district, where I originally, um, where I grew up in Indiana. That's where I became a Hoosier uh, after I moved for school, and so I know the ninth district really well. And yeah, Democrats totally have a shot in the ninth district. Um, though it's it's a tougher one now with redistricting. So I'll be interested to see what um, what our congressional candidates down there do. Um, I got a call the other night from Mike Fife, who's already fundraising. So um, we are taking this seriously, and it is not a foregone conclusion down in the ninth. And uh, I frankly am hopeful to see uh, an active primary on the Republican side to see exactly what we're going to be dealt with. In, um, in with their candidates in, in the ninth primary because uh, that is an area of the state in great need. And when we have race to the bottom politics and folks campaigning uh, to remove food literally out of Hoosier's mouths with their uh, bills regarding uh, SNAP benefits and food stamps, that's not good for, uh, for Indiana. And so I'll be very interested to see who uh, the GOP picks for the ninth district. Uh, Brad Klopstad, let me get your thoughts on Trey Hollingsworth stepping down and possibly uh, running for governor. Sure. Um, first, Mike, you forgot Jim Merritt's also in there. So, well, that's right. That makes yeah, six. Makes, uh, five guys and a woman. Six. Yes. So, uh, so yeah. So that'll be an interesting race for governor. And who knows? There might be more that that come in. Um, Trey Hollingsworth. This has all kind of been refreshing. Obviously, you know, he he came in and they referred to him as Tennessee Trey. Um, just because he was from Tennessee and it appeared that he might be buying a congressional seat. But in the years that he's been in there, he's represented Indiana as well as anybody. Uh, he's been very conscientious. He's been pro-business. Uh, he's not been a wild, crazy Trumper. So, um, and he held to his promise that he's not going to be a lifer in Congress. I like to see somebody who says, you know what? I've been there long enough. It's time for me to do something else. So kudos to him. And I think that he's going to... Uh, He'll be one of the front runners when we get to the governor's race next year. All right. Our guests on the program are Brad Kloppenstein, Lindsay Ships, and uh, our good friend Mike Murphy. Uh, so now we're going to go to our final portion of the program. We ask our panels over their predictions and prognostications. We look into the crystal ball and sort of weed through the political ether to see what is out there and what folks should be paying attention to. Uh, so, Mike, we'll start with you. What should Hoosiers be looking out for in the next few months? Well, continuing to watch the pandemic because it in impacts all of our lives and all of our businesses, as Lindsay said, that's for sure. Um, and, and I think the, the other things to watch are, you know, gambling is always in the background of every legislative session because there's so much money involved that just dominates every session, if not in the foreground, at least in the background. Um, how we balance our, our tax situation, but probably most importantly, it's not very sexy for the average voter, but it's very important to the future of Indiana is, you know, is the Supreme Court going to rule in favor of the governor? or in favor of the legislature on the, on the constitutional ability to call a special session. That's very important. I mean, it's something that will have, you know, impact for 100 years or so. And uh, I, I hope the governor wins because I think he's right on this issue. Lindsay, what are you looking, what should Hoosiers be paying attention to over the next few months? Well, sadly, despite the fact that there have been bipartisan initiatives filed to legalize marijuana in the state of Indiana, I don't see that happening, sadly. I don't think those bills are going to get heard, despite the news that Indiana has trailed its neighboring states and lost out on a potential revenue source that would really uh, continue to buffer at least that, uh, that amazing surplus that we've got. Um, but a little thing you should look out for is you might see some billboards coming up this week with a familiar face uh, advocating for the expansion of uh, friendly marijuana laws. Brad Klopstein, I'll give you the last word, my friend. Uh, I agree with both Mike and Lindsay on those. Um, yeah, I'm surprised medical marijuana is not going to get the traction that I think it deserves. Um, I do think that that Supreme Court case will probably be the most important thing that happens. 
I think as we look forward, COVID is in its last gasp and is going to burn itself out here fairly shortly. And I think that there will be, unfortunately, maybe fortunately, uh, this will not be a real remarkable legislative session. I would love to see them address gambling in, um, in bars and in in taverns and private clubs. I don't think that they're going to get to that. And I think that, yeah, largely they're going to keep their head down because it's an election year. All right. Well, our guests on the program today have been Brad Klopenstein, the Greater Lawrence Chamber of Commerce, Democrat Lindsay Ships, and our good friend Mike Murphy, a Republican. That's going to do it for this edition of Indiana Issues. Always good to be back. We'll talk to you next time. And special thanks to all of our friends here at the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis. I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndyPolitics.org. Thanks for joining us. And we'll talk to you next time on Indiana Issues.